You may think that the dominant story of human origins is settled, but that is far from the case. The modern humans evolved in Africa 300,000 years ago and then swept into Eurasia around 60,000 years ago, encountering and absorbing a few archaic populations along the way. But there is a problem with this theory, the Neanderthal problem. The Neanderthals, once imagined as brutish cousins, became a brief genetic footnote. About 2% of their DNA lingers in modern Europeans and Asians, but otherwise the species died out. But a provocative alternative picture is now taking shape in some population models. What if the genetic and anatomical core of non-African humans was not African at all, but Neanderthal? In this view, Eurasian peoples would descend mostly from long-established Neanderthal populations who were later transformed by an influx of Homo sapiens genes, genes that carried new cognitive and physical traits without replacing the population itself. It is a theory that inverts one of anthropology's most cherished assumptions. At the heart of the idea is a simple observation. Neanderthals and modern humans are sister lineages that diverged from a common ancestor somewhere between 550,000 and 750,000 years ago. They were never separated by an unbridgeable gulf. Their genomes remained close enough that interbreeding was easy when contact occurred. This is not some fringe idea. Top paleoanthropologists and geneticists have hinted at these ideas in recent years, but rewriting the history of human evolution in a Eurasian-centric model is too controversial. An example of another model that might be able to explain the data that we've been playing with is one where there's much more DNA in Neanderthals from modern humans than the 3 or 5% that's been estimated. Mm. And we can get such models to fit, but here it's 30% or 50% or 70%. If you take the genomes of modern Europeans and Asians and run them through demographic models, you can actually fit the data in more than one way. The standard model says a small group expanded into Eurasia 60,000 years ago, met Aboriginal Neanderthals, and absorbed about 2% of their DNA. But mathematically, you can also fit the data if you assume the opposite. A large Neanderthal-derived Eurasian population persisted and was later upgraded, by a modern human wave that contributed only a minority of genes. This alternative explains why non-Africans share the same Neanderthal genetic segments. They were already Neanderthal, and the Homo sapiens were too few to create deep structure. It also explains why Neanderthals and modern humans have such small genetic distance. There was never a clean replacement, just gene flow, reshaping an existing Eurasian stock. For years, the story of human origins has been told as if modern humans and Neanderthals were two cleanly separated lineages that only met briefly. Genetic studies usually say that people outside Africa carry about 2% Neanderthal DNA, as if this were a small add-on to an otherwise pure Homo sapiens genome. But this picture depends on how we decide which pieces of DNA are Neanderthal and which are modern human. The boundary is not sharp. In fact, a growing number of population geneticists have pointed out that much of the Neanderthal genome is so similar to the ancestral genome of Homo sapiens that we cannot reliably tell it apart. This uncertainty means the true Neanderthal contribution to modern people could be much higher than the often quoted figure. The usual method for estimating Neanderthal ancestry compares modern human genomes to a few high-coverage Neanderthal genomes, such as those from Vindija and Altai. Segments that look more like the Neanderthal than like present-day people are counted as Neanderthal introgression. But this only works well for regions where Neanderthal and modern human sequences are clearly different. Large parts of the genome are ancestral, unchanged since before the split of the two lineages, and these cannot be classified. If a piece of DNA is identical in a Neanderthal and a modern human, it will not be counted as Neanderthal, even though Neanderthals carried it too. This creates a strong downward bias in percentage estimates. Another problem is that we usually assume a single, clean split between modern humans and Neanderthals. In reality, the two groups likely exchanged genes for hundreds of thousands of years. One study on Neanderthal mitochondria, for example, shows that gene flow from Homo sapiens into Neanderthals replaced their maternal line at some point between 470,000 and 220,000 years ago. 
such repeated admixture events blur the distinction between us and them. If Neanderthals already carried many lineages that were also present in early Homo sapiens, those regions will look human today and not be counted as archaic, even though they were part of the Neanderthal genome. There is also the effect of negative selection. Segments of Neanderthal DNA that were harmful in modern humans have been purged, leaving behind pieces that blend easily into the background of our genome. Over tens of thousands of years, recombination chops up the Neanderthal input into smaller and smaller fragments that become impossible to distinguish from ancient human variation. As a result, the fraction we can still detect, about 2%, may be just the most obvious residue of a much larger original contribution. Some geneticists, including David Reich, have said that if you build different demographic models, you can fit the observed data with scenarios in which non-Africans are largely descended from a Neanderthal-like population, but later received an infusion of Homo sapiens genes. These models highlight that the two lineages were never fully separate. Modern humans outside Africa may be better described as a continuum of Eurasian archaics, shaped by repeated pulses of Homo sapien genes rather than a clean replacement event. Our genome may carry far more Neanderthal ancestry than we can measure, simply because most of it looks human now. If this model were correct, the Eurasian fossil record would suddenly look different. Classic Neanderthal skulls, long and low with projecting faces and powerful brow ridges, would not represent an extinct cousin, but the deep ancestry of modern Europeans and Asians. Transitional forms, such as those in Spain or Neanderthal-like remains in Israel, might not be evolutionary dead ends. They could be our own grandparents. Later, as Homo sapiens produced populations with lighter skeletons, globular skulls, and perhaps new neural wiring for complex language and symbolic thought, some of these people migrated into Eurasia. They did not replace the aboriginal Neanderthals outright. Instead, they mixed, spreading key modern innovations, while the old Eurasian population remained numerically dominant. Over time, selection favoured some of the incoming genes, those that improved brain development, speech, metabolism, or immunity, but the demographic base stayed Neanderthal. One of the striking consequences of this view is that Africa remains vital, but its role changes. Instead of sending waves and waves of modern humans that erased previous Eurasians, Africa becomes a source of critical gene packages that diffuse into a mostly Neanderthal population. Cultural and cognitive leaps, perhaps symbolic art, long-distance exchange or better projectile weapons, could have piggybacked on a relatively small gene flow. This fits with an image of Eurasia as a long-inhabited continent where hominins had adapted to Ice Age climates for hundreds of thousands of years. The Neanderthal body, short, strong, cold-tolerant, would not have been wiped out. Rather, it was genetically tweaked by modern innovations producing the versatile peoples who later built the upper Paleolithic and ultimately modern Eurasian societies. If this scenario holds, the celebrated Out of Africa event would still have happened, but would be more like a cultural and genetic graft onto a long-standing Eurasian tree. The narrative shifts from replacement to transformation. Instead of a small band conquering and replacing Neanderthals, a modest trickle of humans entered, introduced powerful traits, and were absorbed by a population that was already vast. It also explains why the deepest genetic splits and diversity patterns remain in Africa. Those populations stayed large and structured, while Eurasia went through bottlenecks and later introgressions. Africa remains the deepest reservoir of our lineage, but Eurasia would have its own independent continuity, stretching back to the first Neanderthal ancestors. Most researchers still back the mainstream model just because the fossil and genetic evidence fits it more cleanly. Africa holds the oldest clearly modern skeletons, although even this fact is debatable. The timing of Neanderthal DNA introgression looks like a brief pulse 50,000 to 60,000 years ago, not a long, continuous mixing. Non-Africans show only about 2% Neanderthal ancestry when measured against native Africans. Proponents of the Neanderthal core scenario argue those percentages can be misleading. If the modern human reference population itself already carried some archaic DNA, estimates of Neanderthal ancestry may be deflated. 
They also suggest that repeated back migrations from Africa, combined with selection against some Neanderthal sequences, could have masked a much larger original contribution. At present, this model remains a provocative alternative rather than accepted history. But it is powerful as a thought experiment because it reminds us how much of our deep past is reconstructed from statistical models and fragmentary bones. If future ancient genomes from early Eurasians, especially pre-60,000-year-old fossils, show high continuity with Neanderthals, the balance could shift. Imagine sequencing a 100,000-year-old human from Siberia or Europe and finding it almost fully Neanderthal, but trending toward modern anatomy. That would lend this theory credibility. Indeed, the Neanderthal problem has been debated for over 100 years. In 1915, Dr. Arthur Keith wrote, Of the various problems relating to extinct forms of man, none is of greater interest than that which concerns Homo neanderthalensis. This peculiar and extinct species of man appeared in Europe about the commencement of the Musterian cultural period, and all traces of him vanished towards the close of that period. Where he came from and where he finally disappeared, we do not know, hence every additional fact we can collect about him is of value. The most marvellous aspect of the problem raised by the recognition of Neanderthal man as a distinct type is his apparently sudden disappearance. He is replaced with the dawn of the Aurignacian period by men of the same type as now occupy Europe. What happened at the end of the Musterian period, we can only guess. But those who observe the fate of the Aboriginal races of Australia will have no difficulty in accounting for the disappearance of Homo neanderthalensis. A more virile form extinguished him. The one thing we are now certain of is that he was not suddenly converted into the modern type of man. This is a very profound thought that still keeps many of us awake at night. In the end, the Neanderthal core hypothesis challenges the comforting simplicity of a single exodus and forces us to picture human evolution as a braided stream, not a single sweep. We may not be the neat conquerors we imagine, but the heirs of Eurasian survivors, remade by a trickle of genes and ideas. If that picture proves true, it will not diminish Africa's importance. It will deepen it, while also restoring to the Neanderthals a role as our real Eurasian ancestors. Now click on these other videos to learn more about our human journey.